Well, hello. It's Bruce Williams again. It's a beautiful Monday morning, 27th of April, and we're still sheltering in place here in Bethesda, Maryland. Are you ready for the first gross path challenge of the new week? I sure am, so let's begin. Slide number one is tissue from a dog. Can you name this condition and give me two other lesions that you might see in this animal? Okay, time's up. This is a cyst of Rathke's pouch. This is seen in young puppies who are normal at birth and up until about two weeks of age. The cyst is derived from a failure of differentiation of the oropharyngeal ectoderm of Rathke's pouch, which gives rise to the pars distalis or the pars glandularis of the pituitary and it doesn't form properly, you get this cyst, and then you don't get the hormones that are normally secreted by this part of the pituitary. The most important, and there are a number of them, but the most important of them are adrenocorticotropic hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone. And because these are never secreted, this animal's uh, adrenal glands will not develop they early on develop Addisonian tendencies. Also, you will not see the thyroids develop. These animals have a lot of problems. So, in addition to a failure of differentiation of the thyroid glands and the adrenal glands, you may see other things like a poor puppy-like hair coat, which eventually will be shed, the animal will be partially alopecic, and the skin will be hyperpigmented. You often will see uh, a puppy dentition that is maintained uh, throughout the animal's life. The growth plates will be uh, very slow to close if they do, and so this animal will be much smaller than its litter mates and uh, generally will have sort of this puppy uh, predilection. It, it has a breed predilection for German Shepherd dogs. Now, um, that's what I'm looking for on this. You can also have uh, cysts in the pituitary, which generally don't cause a lot of problems. Um, you have normal formation of the pars distalis, and these cysts are derived from a, uh, the distal craniopharyngeal duct. Um, they are ciliated cysts. You'll see them in the pituitary or around the pituitary, and usually they're incidental, and you can see them as, in as much as 50% of dogs. Okay. Uh, if you put that down, you don't have any other, uh, uh, other lesions associated with it. So hopefully you went for the one that everybody needs to know about, and that is Rathke's pouch cysts, which cause a range of problems in these unfortunate animals. Okay, slide number two is tissue from a calf. Can you name this condition? Okay, we are looking at or the placentation. This is actually the amnion, and these are known as amniotic plaques. Okay, remember that the fetus is developing within the amnion, it's floating free within the amnion, and these are actually little bits of skin detritus, uh, epithelial cells that are sloughed off of the developing fetus. They float down to the bottom of the amnion, and they attach. They don't know that they've fallen off the fetus, and so they grow a bit attached to the amnion. So these are just little epithelial plaques. It's a normal incidental finding. You may see some mineralization in here. Doesn't really mean anything. You just want to make sure that you know that this is an incidental finding and not any form of pathology. Slide number three is tissue from a rhesus macaque. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and the cause of this lesion? Okay, time's up. This is one of those lesions you hope that you never see in your, uh, in your career. Um, we are looking at uh, diffuse severe congestion of the duodenum. There may actually be hemorrhage here a little bit of necrosis, but congestion hemorrhage of the duodenum or the gastric pylorus would be absolutely fine as an answer. And this is a very specific lesion to 
the hemorrhagic fevers that affect non-human primates, one well, of the most famous of which is Ebola. This was an animal that had been injected with a strain of Ebola virus. Well, you want to think about all of these uh, viruses together because they can all cause this particular lesion, uh, simian hemorrhagic fever, uh, Marburg would be the other two that I would have on my list. But if you see this, this is one that you want to associate with Ebola. There are a lot of uh, excellent papers that were written on this back in the late 90s and 2000s um, by the folks up at the U.S. Army Medical Research of Infectious Disease. And this is from one of those papers. Slide number four is tissue from a llama. Can you name these structures? Okay, time's up. Llamas and alpacas and other camelids have a very interesting uh, stomach uh, of which there are three compartments. Uh, first two are saculated, third one is the glandular uh, part of the stomach. The first two form sort of a, a rumen-like uh, uh, function for these animals. And in C1, you have these saccules, which go down into the mucosa. They are epithelial line. And sometimes you will get a little bit of feedstuff, maybe a pebble, and it will form, uh, it will attract uh, minerals, you will get these sort of lamellated concretions. These are known as gastroliths. Okay, not that different from enteroliths that we see in ruminants, usually farther down in the track. Um, and enteroliths as well as gastroliths, you know, they, they form in places where there's a lot, not a lot of motion, um, but usually there's always a nidus to start. They get uh, uh, sort of stuck in these saccules. They can have some uh, some pointy edges to them, but they don't seem to cause any problem for these camelids, or llamas, and alpacas may develop gastroliths within the first uh, compartment of their stomach. Slide number five is tissue from a squirrel. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and the cause? Okay, time's up. This one is this particular virus comes up very often in, uh, in these lectures. And, and as we say, you don't need to think about this. What we're looking at are pox um, on the skin of this particular animal. And these are caused by a leporopox virus, lepera meaning rabbit. And it's an interesting virus that causes lesions in multiple species as well as multiple lesions in rabbits. The same leprobox virus will cause these lesions, which are known as squirrel fibromas. The morphologic diagnosis that I'm looking for is uh, multifocal proliferative and ulcerative dermatitis, or areas of proliferation of stramspongiosin. And then the oldest part of each of these lesions will be necrotic, because it's the part that over time has succumbed to the cytopathic effect of the intracytoplasmic pox virus. The name of the condition is squirrel pox. Some people call them squirrel fibromas. And as we said, it's caused by a lepera pox, the same virus that in rabbits will cause two distinct diseases, myxomatosis and shoat fibromas. Slide number six is tissue from a cat. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. It's a little weird. We're looking at the larynx here. We're looking at the trachea. Here's the esophagus here. And we can actually see on the dorsal surface of the thyroid, uh, sorry, the trachea, we can see the thyroid glands and very enlarged hyperplastic parathyroid glands. So this is diffuse bilateral. Sort of funny that the thyroid's on top of the trachea, but you know, in a lot of animals, you can see that the thyroid tends to um, not always be in the same bilateral spots that you would expect them to. Nice part about this is you can see that the parathyroid glands are absolutely huge. And when you see this, you know that the animal has a systemic demand for calcium, or at least thinks it does because it can't excrete phosphorus. Um, 
you have the liberation of parathyroid hormone in, in reaction to a low systemic calcium. And this is most commonly seen in cats, especially old cats, as a result of chronic renal failure where the kidney is unable to excrete uh, enough phosphorus. The phosphorus elevates over time. It drives down calcium levels by Starling's law. And then this is the stimulus for parathyroid hyperplasia. When that uh, elevated phosphorus multiplied by the calcium level gets uh, into the range of 70 or so, you start to see mineralization in other parts of the body. Um, you'll see mineralization in the kidney, uh, the basement membranes of the tubules, Bowman's capsule, and the blood vessels. You will see it in the stomach, in the middle of the gastric mucosa. You may see it uh, in the intercostal muscles and ultimately you will see it in uh, blood vessels and of the body and unfortunately in the lungs. So you have this metastatic calcification. You know, initially the phosphorus is high, the calcium is driven down. Okay, the body tries to keep everything in. But over time, the parathyroids are gonna work really hard. That calcium is gonna come back up. The phosphorus you never can get rid of, so it stays up that's when you get no static calcification in the body. Slide number seven is tissue from a moose. Can you name the disease and give me the cause? Okay, time's up. Very noble looking animal here. And you can see that there are a there's a very large area where the animal uh, has lost its hair. So we have areas of alopecia, some excoriation. It looks uh, pretty bad here. This is a normal hair coat, and all of this um, has been lost. It's been rubbed off. If you would weigh this animal as opposed to normal uh, cows, you would see that normal moose cows, of course, you will see that uh, um, it probably weighs significantly less. And this is a problem that continues to develop across North America as a result of climate change. The condition is known as, these animals are called ghost moose um, because of sort of the whitish silvery look to them. Um, and it is caused by infection by a tick known as Dermacenta alba pictus. And uh, this is causing a steep decline in the population of uh, moose in the eastern United States. It's seen throughout the United States. And uh, this Dermacenta albopictus tick is an animal that spends its entire life cycle, except for the uh, last phase where it drops off and lays eggs on the animal. But you can have amazing numbers on these poor unfortunate moose, up to 75,000 ticks in a single animal. Um, they are miserable, they suck blood, they cause skin irritation, and the animals um, are, are rubbing on whatever. Obviously, they are not taking care of themselves and eating properly because of, of the puritis, and uh, they tend not to be able to overwinter as the normal healthy moose can. So this is called a ghost moose. The cause is the tick dermacenter albopictus. Slide number eight is tissue from a horse. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and name the condition? Okay, time's up. We're at the hind end of the spinal cord, large spinal roots coming out, which probably innervating bladder, rectum, perineum. This is the cauda equina of the, uh, of the spinal cord. Everybody's got a cauda equina, um, horses especially, but it's just the tail end of the spinal cord. And uh, horses will develop something called the cauda equina syndrome. It is an inflammatory syndrome that no one's ever really been able to figure out exactly what causes it. People say, well, it's herpes virus or it's an autoimmune disease. It probably is most likely an autoimmune disease because you can't really bring, you know, get infectious agents out of this. The morphologic diagnosis of Kawana syndrome is 
a multifocal chronic granulomatous spinal neuritis. It primarily affects the spinal nerves um, and it leaves the rest of the spinal cord for the most part alone. It's occasionally seen in spinal nerve roots and other parts of the spinal cord and affecting cranial nerves, but it leaves the spinal cord proper alone. It is a chronic granulomatous disease. You have destruction of the uh, nerves within the spinal roots. You have tremendous fibrosis as a result of a proliferation of the paramecium. Everything is sort of glommed together. It is a very good descriptive lesion that pops up on certification exams from time to time. So I would encourage everybody that's taking certification exams in coming years to go to VISPO um, and take a good look at this. Maybe take a whack at describing it because the last time you, or the first time you describe something like this, you don't want it to be in Tampa or in Utrecht. So Carter Quine syndrome, probably autoimmune. You can imagine what the clinical signs are going to be. They're going to be referable to the nervous destruction. So these animals may have uh, difficulty moving in the hind limbs. They may have anesthesia or paresthesia of the perineum and tail. They may have uh, paresthesia of the rectum or difficulty uh, excreting feces and bladder acne. Slide number nine is tissue from a cow. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a likely cause? Okay, time's up. And we have talked a lot about vesicular diseases. Uh, in one of our immediately previous uh, uh, lectures, we had a very nice picture of vesicular disease in a pig. And one of the most important things um, to come out of that discussion is, you know, we get very concerned about vesicular diseases, even though the vast majority really don't do much. And the reason we get excited about them and they're all reportable diseases is because we are trying to identify one particular disease early, and that is foot and mouth disease. Foot and mouth disease can be transmitted um, and spread by large ruminants, small ruminants, pigs, horses. Everybody gets it. It doesn't kill anybody, but it causes tremendous problems um, uh, with raising uh, production animals because if you take a look at this, the morphologic diagnosis is a focally extensive uh, necrotizing glossitis um, with ulceration. But what sets foot and mouth apart from most of the other ones that will affect cattle, including uh, vesicular cell stomatitis, or some of the other things that will cause ulcers in the mouth of cattle, like blue tongue or mucosal disease or whatever, is the tremendous underrunning of the epithelium that you see and you see these very large ulcers these are the gloving injuries and if you grab this animal here you may end up with the entire lingual epithelium in your hand so you get these very large defects um, in foot and mouth disease it's caused by bovine aptovirus as i said before it's the same aptovirus in every species but the way that you want to identify your agents is by the species and the uh, the name of the virus. So bovine aptovirus, this is foot and mouth disease, a great picture of the tremendous defects that you can see, just all of the epithelium there down at the base is, uh, undergoes necrosis as a result of viral infection. Um, as we said before, that cattle get lesions in their mouth, they get lesions around the coronary bands, they don't wanna walk, they certainly don't wanna eat, and they're not gonna put on any weight. If it's a dairy cow, it's not gonna be able to give you milk. And, and so there are tremendous losses of production. It's very contagious. And so usually what happens when there's an outbreak is that there is depopulation because you don't want it to spread. This is a virus that um, is so extremely contagious. It's spread by, by veterinarians and by uh, shoes and jeeps and whatever. Uh, supposedly, it is very transmissible, even can be airborne. Um, cattle tend to get very distinctive lesions, and they're an indicator species. Pigs tend to be an amplifier species. 
um, they produce tremendous amounts of the virus in the blisters that they form. And small ruminants hardly form any lesions at all. And so they can transport it very easily um, because they may have very small blisters on their coronary band that you wouldn't even notice. So if they move from place to place, they're carrying it with them. So just remember, foot and mouth disease is the important vesicular disease. And we get very excited about all the rest because of the possibility that might be foot and mouth disease. Okay, and slide number 10 is tissue from a, a weaning, weanling pig. That could be a grower. Uh, so can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? And name two other affected organs. Okay, time's up. Uh, this is a focally extensive severe chemosis and dermal edema. Anything along those lines, I'm going to take. The cause is a shiga producing or verotoxin producing E. coli. Um, we are looking at a disease that is known as edema disease. And edema disease is... is uh, produced by a number of enterotoxigenic E. coli, which normally will cause diarrhea of certain strains, will produce verotoxin, also known as shigatoxin. Uh, and shigatoxin, the extra toxin, um, looks for places in the body which have high levels of uh, receptor for a compound called globoacyl tetraceramide. And that's something that you don't need to know as long as you know the shiga toxin. And when it binds to these receptors, it causes tremendous edema. And the receptors are in stereotypical places in the pig, like the eyelids, like the skin over the back. And that's not a big problem. But it, there are also high levels of receptors in certain organs, like the mesocolon of the spiral colon. So you get tremendous edema there, like the wall of the stomach like the larynx, and so you'll get laryngeal swelling. Animals will have some difficulty breathing, and when they squeal, they have a particular high-pitched sort of strangled type of squeal, which makes them fairly easy to identify. And then, um, sadly, there are also receptors in certain parts of the brain, and you can't have a lot of edema in the brain, so a lot of these animals will develop neurologic signs before they die. So. Uh, this is edema disease, and the cause is a shiga producing E. coli. Well, that is the end of today's Gross Math Challenge. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed seeing these, uh, uh, these old pictures, some of which I hadn't seen in years, and telling some of these stories. Thank you so much for spending time. I hope that you will come back tomorrow, because I don't believe we have a uh, a Wednesday slide conference to results to release or a Friday seminar. Um, I do want to make sure that everybody knows that starting the 12th of May, we will, the foundation will have bi-weekly, all-day, race-accredited day seminars on particular themes. And the one on May 12th is on equine diseases. And we have a fantastic lineup of speakers, including Dr. Paco Uzal on the alimentary system, uh, Dr. Sue Stover on uh, musculoskeletal disease and injuries of racehorses. Uh, Dr. Fabio Del Piero will be talking about equine neuropathology. And then uh, we will finish that day with a lecture that I've never seen anyone do in one spot before. Looking forward to that. And that's Dr. Leandro Teixeira from Coplau talking about equine ophthalmic pathology. So I hope to see you then. I hope to see you for another Gross Path Challenge tomorrow. Have a great day, y'all.